Half science, half magic, a lot of what ifs, and you're always searching for the perfect bite. It's that philosopher's stone. And just like the alchemists, it's nothing but a metaphor. My friend and colleague, Chef Scott Nystrom, has been working with kids out on the land, in the garden, and teaching in addition to his chef duties. Today, I sat down with him and chatted about all of the miracles that he is teaching the kids. And I think you will be utterly delighted to join me in this conversation today. It's so cool to be able to show up at that class. And what are we going to make today? We need to make lemonade because we're having an event. But I need to build this into a big lesson. So we'll talk about the food medicine of hydration. We'll talk about the magic of the flowers coming from the seeds built into our lemonade. And then we're going to talk about alchemy and about this lemonade itself is a balancing of the elements. Mm -hmm. Now, early alchemists and tying in science, but this edge between science and magic that those early wizard alchemists kind of bridged this, this, uh, this beautiful, special, liminal place of understanding. And that's how I feel as a chef. I get to be a food wizard. Yeah. And so to, to have this, like, I got to write alchemy on the board of an elementary school and we had our cauldrons of water and we, Got mm -hmm. to meet Sumac and Sia, Saskatoon. Mm. We got to meet uh, Nutka Rose and we had some Lovely. strawberries and bachelor buttons and mint. Aww. And how do these express the elements of alchemy? How do they balance each other in their own brews? And then really putting this mindful intention behind it. We talked about how if a wizard was going to create a spell or an alchemist was going to, going to create a, a scientific brew, it wouldn't just be thrown into the pot. There would be a lot of intention that goes into it. Mm -hmm. And so I had them count each item individually, hold it in your hand and give it a, give it a gratitude. We've been focusing mm -hmm. a lot on gratitude this month, but also even just give it a little blessing, like one, two, three, four, five, make this lemonade come alive. And that intention behind it with all of their little voices and all of their spirits pouring into that, you get these like wizard lemonades. It's, mm -hmm. it's magic. So it's not just like sumac lemonade. It's, it's kid charged with intention. And magical. then we get to go bring it to the fishing pond and Aww. be a part of the land and drink this magical brew to hydrate us. And it's still delicious lemon. Do they know how lucky they are to have someone like you come and teach that? Like They love me. It's... Did you have someone like that when you were little? Or is that developed later on? I had my grandma and she yeah. she had a, a mystic connection to the world right. around. But never explicitly so. Mm -hmm. I had to read between the lines growing up. Yeah. But her house was always decorated with wizards and angels and little dragons okay. and mystical things. Yeah. But <laughs> it was never an explicit, um, we do this because we are wizards. Right. There was no teaching. Yeah. But the, you yeah, filled in the blanks. She was an yeah. experiential teacher. Yeah. You would make salad with her and you would ask to help. And she would always just pull your nose and your taste buds in. And there was no recipes. It was always measured by hand and smell and taste. Yeah. Whatever's in the garden, it would be a go out barefoot and get me these specific herbs. I need you to yeah. cut me 15 chives for the, the salad. Or I need these specific petals from the flowers. And even her recipes for salads that we've our family has tried to recreate after she's passed, It there's no recipe. And so uh. it, would, it would always be a... It should look like this at this mm -hmm. stage, and it should taste like this at this stage, um, but just following your nose and your taste buds. Are you able to replicate it even without the recipe? Yeah, it's, it's a little yeah. competition amongst the family yeah. who can do it best, <laughs> who has a bit more of that, and we're always bouncing off each other. Yeah. So inspiring my students, though, at yeah. school with those same principles of mindfully experiencing food with all of your senses. We don't taste food, we experience food which is cool with kindergartners who have a very restricted palate sometimes. They say, I, I'm like a French fry and chicken nugget kid. Right. I don't like Saskatoon berries. I don't like potatoes. I can't even like potatoes. Like, really? Well, you, you don't like the taste maybe, but what about your other senses? Mm -hmm. I want you to pick it up. I want you to tell me the color. I want you to feel it. I want you to listen to the sound of the Saskatoon berry. Give it a smell. If you don't want to taste it, that's only one sense, but don't deprive yourself of the other senses. Mm -hmm. And then once they connect to it in that way, amongst their peers, there's almost that peer pressure of, oh, 
Chef made us something new and different. We really loved it. I can see my friends trying the hummus. And even though I wasn't sure about it, Chef doesn't usually lead me astray. He doesn't make me eat things that I don't like. So maybe I'll like it, Chef. I'm going to try the hummus. Aww. No way. That's a big win for me. And then they come back for thirds, and now they love hummus. That's right. So that's just, that's the that's the purpose behind it all. Yes. Just fostering this deeper connection to food. And so that's why I don't have time for as many caterings. Well, it's so important. And, you know, we've talked a lot in the past about how uh, stressful it is knowing that kids don't know where food comes from. So you're not only teaching them that, but you're you're going extra miles to to give them that really deeper connection and, and teachings that their parents maybe don't have time to do. So you get to offer that to them, and that's such a gift. Many parents still don't appreciate or even know where their food is coming yeah. from. We're so reliant on grocery stores. And even those parents who go to the market are still treating it almost as consumers. Don't get me wrong. There's many people who are deeply connected with their gardens or their own family history of food. Yeah. But to have have students at that impressionable age, we don't even call them students. We call them learners. Yeah. And they're there to absorb all of this wisdom around in, in a way that I want them to know the connection to the land and know where their food comes from at the farmer's market as logically as one plus one equals two. Yeah. And so they grow up and these are just, this is just the way we live. Right. We, we yeah. always mindfully taste the first bite. Mm-hmm. You're always present with the textures and wondering the hands that touched your food along the way. Mm-hmm. I want that to be instinctive. I want them to feel the call of the land when the first snow starts to fall or that first frosty morning. Many of us feel that feeling, that first morning of cold. And you go out and you say, I got to put the garden to bed. <laughs> Something doesn't feel, feels like it's time to button things up. Uh-huh. Or the first, that first day of spring where it's still a little cold, but the sun hits just right. And you just feel this like whisper on the wind. It's like time to put down some seeds. Mm-hmm. And you don't have that calling unless you can quiet the daily mind and really tune into the land. It's and true. it speaks to you. Mm-hmm. And so to have that, to try to teach that instinctive connection. Mm-hmm. It's been really cool to see with the kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I feel like um, it might be easier for kids. They're closer to that than, than we are adults. We have so much other stuff in the way already, so it's really hard for us to practice like meditation and like ways to calm down to get ourselves to the land. But I feel like kids are, it's more accessible for them maybe. I think it was accessible for us too. We just oh, forgot. Oh, for sure. We, we got distracted by our busy lives. Exactly. But they need it most in yeah, that time yeah. is to have those healthy emotional regulation strategies for the big upheavals of life, which as adults seem relatively simple. Mm-hmm. But for a child, losing a toy, a pet, a family member is absolute crisis. Yeah. And we know as adults now that as we dig back into our own childhood traumas and events of our past, that those things are immensely impactful. And Mm -hmm. so to have those strategies of how to grow up healthy as a kid in that connection to yourself and your place, how to take your big deep breaths, Mm -hmm. how to feel the land under your feet, sets you up for being a healthy adult. Yeah. Those things. Yeah. So important. So the the reason that I wanted you to come do this podcast was because last time we were talking, you were like, I'm working with these kids and we're doing really fun things and we're blending up, we're blending up veggies and or no, blending up strawberries, making the strawberries dance. <laughs> and I'm like, we need to talk about these dancing strawberries. <laughs> strawberries dancing. That's it. It's like uh, animism. Everything has life. And so these things we associate as non-living, the land, the rocks, the the place around us is alive. Food is alive. And so really helping them personify the things that they eat as that sense of connection and gratitude for this life that we're consuming. So the dancing strawberries, I think we were making, it was either lemonade or ice cream. Oh, I thought it was smoothies. Oh, ice cream. So the ice cream that we make at school is very smoothie adjacent. Mm. It's um, strawberry nice cream. Oh, yeah. And so the magic is coconut milk oh. and the fat of the coconut milk you blend it up with the frozen berries and nice. the oils of the coconut love to get solid when they get cold and so yeah. as soon as you blend them with the frozen berries they're already becoming a soft serve and then it can hang out in the fridge Amazing. Um, so we we had an ice cream class at school and were they we, so excited they they love it that's yeah. every class is something yeah. new and exciting so fun. we're always tasting something new yeah um so yeah the ice cream class was a big hit 
We made some blueberry lemonade. Mm. We made some strawberry ice cream. Um, I think we made some like chocolate banana ice cream as well. Mm. And really they're blended fruit flavored in one way or another. And those homemade ice creams can have a hard time freezing solid sometimes. But when they have a high natural sugar content, it helps the freezing. So the fruits or even some blended up dates in the banana ice cream helps it so that you can actually scoop it once okay. it's been in the freezer. Because hmm. sometimes it turns into a brick without all the chemical industrial stabilizers we're used right. to when we get a tub of vanilla ice cream. Yeah. Hmm. That's yummy. <laughs> it, now it, I just want ice yummy. cream. <laughs> yeah. Those kind of natural ice creams and yeah. the lemonades just get me through the summer. Yeah, for sure. If you're going to drink water, amazing. But if you can chuck some flowers and yeah. cucumbers and a strawberry in there, it's going to make it a little bit more tasty. Totally. And lemonade anything. Even the sumac, which is not lemony at all, still has that acidity. Yeah, yeah. And it just yeah. leaches that out into the water. Two mm -hmm. days mm -hmm. in the fridge, you have to add some maple. It's already so sour. And mm -hmm. it's just exactly what your body needs on a hydrating day. And that acidity makes everything else so much more exciting as well. And get some extra electrolytes in there. Mm -hmm. It's like nourishing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I there was a, a podcast I did um, with another RHN recently. And we were talking about seasonal eating and how that's like just the fastest way to understand it for people who aren't connected to the seasons of food and the cycles is that nature provides for you in the season what your body needs so like all the fresh fruit has everything our body needs when things are so hot and it's so cooling and refreshing and so full of water which we need we need the hydration right so it just it just makes sense it's like intuitive um what are what are some other uh like food projects that you that you have the kids have their eyes opened to well, the food projects also follow the season. I write my lessons like I write a menu. So mm -hmm. if it's a, a hot, sunny day, that's a good day for ice cream. Where it probably wouldn't be the best in the, th the thick of January. <laughs> and fermented foods. We had a great unit on fermentation with my older students. And we saved that one for the off season in the winter. Yeah. Because fermenting in the summer makes for very quick bubbly <laughs> messes because yeah. bacteria is so active. <laughs> but in the winter, we had an incredible unit where I spent four different classes being able to really dig deep, planting kind of like the initial vocabulary, you call it scaffolding the information mm. for them. So what is a fermented food? What is a probiotic thing? So that we were able to start by making just some basic like fermented carrots in a, in a salt brine, let them go for a week so that next week we're able to visit the carrots as we made sauerkraut. And as we made the sauerkraut, we were able to start to dig deeper into our body's microbiome and what actually happens with these fermented foods in our guts. And then let the sauerkraut go. The next week we came back and we made kombucha. And mm -hmm. this understanding now of the symbiosis between the fermented organisms in our body, the microorganisms in the soil and the world all around, yeah. which then transitioned the next week into composting. And nice. how do you see fermenting, ferment, fermentation from food all the way to the soil? Um, we made a rot box where we watched, um, well, first of all, we had our fermented feast to wrap up oh, our yeah. sourdough and pickles oh. and salami and cheese and chocolate and <laughs> mustards and anything fermented <laughs> was really? delicious. But then all of the leftovers from that, the bread, the trims of the pickles, even pieces of the meat, even some plastic. We just stuck it all in a box, um, a lidded Tupperware to kind of watch how it would rot and break mm -hmm. down to understand those microorganisms. And then did a whole unit on compost after that, where we saw a healthy compost mm -hmm. or what is an unhealthy rotting in this rot box? What kind of molds would grow um, and then making those parallel connections between the life inside of us, the life in our food, the life in the soil, mm -hmm. and how do we act as stewards for all of that to cultivate these healthy communities of bacteria. It's pretty cool. I can just hear the kids going, ew. <laughs> and at the same <laughs> time, also molding. like, really, chef? This is mold? Really? Chocolate's fermented? Right. This fuzzy stuff on the outside of brie cheese, that's actually mold? <laughs> You mean there's bacteria inside of me? Oh, the funniest one. We watched a video, a great animated video, 
And of course, if you're talking about the human microbiome, at the end, it was, and those people who can be quite sick with an imbalanced microbiome are actually experiencing uh, or exploring the science of fecal transplants, mm. where they will actually take the, the microbiome of a very healthy per person's gut mm -hmm. and use that into, uh, by implanting that into a very wow. sick person's biome. And that yeah. can actually, um, it, it sounds a little gross, but it, it works to reset their gut bacteria. Totally. I had a parent ask me, toward me in the class the other day and said, I, I got to ask you, this has been on my mind. Did you actually talk about poop transplants in oh. class? Like, well, you know what? We did. We talked about all kinds of things. And I gave her a very sciencey explanation on why it was important. Yeah. And of course, it's, it's cool to broach those gross topics with the kids because that's a hook. Yeah. They're, now they're listening. True. And in the way that we learn at our school is very inquiry based. Mm -hmm. And so what, what are your questions? After every lesson, we either have a big whiteboard or sticky notes and the students get to write down their wonders mm -hmm. about that. And so it might be, um, at the end of a lesson on the microbiome, it's, it's how many bacteria live in my body or is there bacteria on everything or what is a fecal transplant? Where do allergies come from? And that helps me inform my next lesson to then okay. answer all their questions. And we yeah. can just keep building. Amazing. Yeah. Um, what's the most rewarding part for you with all that? They are like little sponges. Yeah. And so having grown up a human in, in the, the public school curriculum is... You can easily find a teacher you might relate to. And if you love learning, and I did, thankfully, then you can find a connection in one place or another. Mm -hmm. But many students don't find that connection and can just be pushed from one grade to the other, absorbing information to regurgitate it on a test, and then yeah. off you go. And so to, to see the world around me um, hungry for for a healthy connection to ourselves, hungry to make a change for the way that we, the way that we can create a sustainable future mm -hmm. on our planet needs us to all be pushing together and cooperatively into a same healthy mm -hmm. direction. And I find my voice is a lot more, uh, well, well suited, well heard when I can speak to kids, than right. to adults, they're, they're hungry to learn. They are the next generation. So you can, you can change minds. And I've changed some minds with dinner parties with older folks as well. Mm -hmm. But to be able to have a campus of 100 students who trust the words that I'm saying as one plus one equals two. Yeah. To have them um, be concerned about the plants and animals around them. Mm -hmm. To know that our, our world around is full of life and it's all interconnected and interdependent on each other. And by us being stewards of our place, very much the, I guess, the Smokey the Bear, the, the only you can prevent forest fires, but kind of translates. The <laughs> phrase I use is, if not you, then who? Mm -hmm. And if you see a piece of trash, pick it up. If you see a struggling worm on the sidewalk, send them to some soil. If you, if you see someone in need, help them up. Mm -hmm. And that connection to ourselves and our community planting seeds for a better world i feel mm -hmm. and that's so satisfying to me it's Absolutely. it feels like social responsibility to be a part of your community in a way that can affect the greatest change for the common good yeah amazing planting huge seeds for sure so how would you uh how would you inspire people for their coming season of gardening and markets how would you get people excited to get back in their kitchens and oh, go find a farmer's market themselves? Yeah, farmer's for market sure. is like church for me. It is church. <laughs> find a community of people who are passionate about the food. All of these artisans who pour their spirit Souls. into what they do. Yeah, they they focus all of their efforts, whether they're gardening or crafting or creating these artisanal masterpieces of the products around. They have so much invested in their one product. And to be able to meet them and to have a conversation with what's important about that food is just inspiring to you. They will know their crop well. They might have chefs they sell to that they can recommend ways to cook strange vegetables you've never seen. 
but just the colors and the smells will be inspiring. Mm -hmm. Find something you've never had before and try something new. So definitely start with the farmer's market. It it is always on the pulse of the season. Yeah. Because what's growing now is what you're going to find at the market. Yeah. You won't find asparagus in October and you won't find peaches in May. Yeah. Unfortunately, this year might you might not find peaches at all. I know where you're shopping. <laughs> our climate is fragile, and to rely on our local markets is a beautiful thing. That in times of of storms and floods and climate change, out there in communities beyond mine, mm-hmm. in our globalized food system, although our our inner communities still feel the effects of a hard freeze killing all the peaches, by being able to connect with your farmers and see what grows well. I know that so the road got washed out to Vancouver and the supply trucks couldn't mm-hmm. come. That's okay because my farmers are only coming from a kilometer away in my city. That's right. And the food still flows. That's mm-hmm. inspiring. So I would say start at the farmer's market. And then if you can be around anything that grows, mm-hmm. go out into your backyard, go to a neighbor's house, find a community garden plot and don't pick, but just connect. Mm-hmm. If you can get barefoot in the soil and really just treat the world around as if it's a living thing and talk to it Mm. talk to the trees find a little flower find a little earthworm thank it for the work that it's providing for your soil um a little flower that's smiling at you from wherever it may be smile back acknowledge these things you don't even have to speak it out loud you can speak it in your heart Mm -hmm. and that connection is going to it's going to connect you Mm -hmm. because once you have that that intimate knowing of your place in the same way that I hope my students feel that calling to plant a seed in the spring, Mm -hmm. then it's so much easier to follow the rhythm of the season because you're in it. You're just dancing to the rhythm. It's already playing. You just have to move to the dance. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. I want to eat all those berries you brought. (laughs) These are the very best berries. The lady who grows these is so passionate about what she does. Are they from Kelowna? These are from Vernon from Holomai in Swan Lake. Um, not certified organic, but pesticide free. Certification is expensive. Oh, yeah. And not everybody does it. And that's just fine. Talk to your farmer because they'll tell you how they grow it. Exactly. And they will tell you passionately. Mm. They've that's been in my, my fridge for that's... three days. And they're not wrapped in plastic or anything. So some of them get a little dry. Oh, my God. Oh. Oh, my God. I did have a dinner party. Tastes so Nick's good. together with a kid's cooking class. Oh, last really? Week. Um, That's cool. Some of my students, their parents reached out and said they, they would love it if Chef Scott could make a personal appearance at their house. <laughs> Aww. So I did a kid's cooking class with adults. And so having to find... Wow. Tasks that were easy enough for kids to complete and keep their hands busy, but yeah. also adventurous enough to make it worthwhile for the adults as well. Yeah. And so this was our first bite. I always start my classes with the first mindful bite. And so this was our first mindful bite. That's what you just did with strawberries? With strawberries. And so as they Mm -hmm. ate it, I just told them where it came from. I told them to hold it, think about the hands that may have picked it. And then as they eat it, think about the sunshine that grew it. And I know these are the best berries. So I know when they eat these, they're like, Mm whoa. Like that's the difference between a sun-ripened market berry in season Versus a plastic crate berry mm. from the superstore that was picked a thousand kilometers away, underripe, ripened mm. with gas, yeah. sitting in yeah. storage. So, and then as we're eating the dinner, the, the dad says to me, he's like, you know what? When you said, can you taste the sunshine in that berry? I could taste the sunshine. <laughs> no one's ever asked me if you could taste sunshine before. And I did. <laughs> I don't know if that was just some mind game or what, but it worked. And I could taste the sunshine. It's a mind game. I was like, that's what we do all the time at school. <laughs> yeah. Because you can taste you the sunshine. You literally can. Yes. And unless you slow down to, to notice that, you would have just kept buying plastic crate berries and deprived yourself of the sunshine magic that is available to you always, if only you tune into it. It's so good. That was the first thing I tasted when I put that strawberry in my mouth was the sunshine. (laughs) (laughs) I hope you were able to receive some beautiful medicine from Scott's words today and inspire you to really slow down and get mindful with your food and your life this summer season. It goes by so, so quickly. So we may as well slow down and taste the sunshine.